Coming up on this episode of Crime Family. Nobody joins a cult. Everyone joins a good thing. You can see this when you watch some of the documentaries about it. There's children, they're singing and they're playing and they're holding hands and smiling and they're dancing on the beach. So that kind of thing. And that's what they use to bring people into this group. They saw this outside facade of just like this happy, singing, joyful life. But Christina describes a very disturbing reality on the inside. And after he left the cult, he became very angry and sought revenge. Especially his mother, like he wanted revenge on his mother. And it's like, you're gonna go to hell or the end of days cult. So you're not going with everybody else when the world ends if you act out against them. So they, you know, they scare people as well. Just that mind control is kind of unbelievable. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Crime Family. I'm your co-host, AJ, as always, and I'm here with my sisters, Stephanie and Katie. And this week is the first of a four-part miniseries. So as you know, if you've been listening to us for a while, we did a miniseries last season on missing and murdered Indigenous women, and all of our listeners really enjoyed it, and it was really good to be able to like take one sort of topic and develop it over a series of episodes. So we really were happy with how that turned out and we just wanted to do it again. So we decided to do a mini series this season, but it's going to be on a different topic this time. And we decided that we are going to delve into cults. If you're like us, you probably find cults super fascinating, but also very confusing. And there's just like so much psychology involved in it. And they're just like really fascinating things that exist. And we just thought it'd be interesting to kind of do our mini series this season on that topic so the three of us each kind of took a different cult so the first three episodes it's going to be each of us sort of talking about the cult that we've researched and then the fourth part is going to be a larger cult that took a lot of research and was really big and pretty well known so we decided to kind of all take on that one together so although we do realize that some of these are probably huge cults and like have a lot of information like there's an entire podcast series just about one cult or like it's full like 10 part documentaries on one cult so we couldn't possibly like we're not going to do 10 episodes on every single cult so we're just going to do our best to like give you kind of an an overview of each cult in the episode and obviously we're going to discuss it as we go but yeah i just kind of wanted to preface it that it's not going to be like super down every rabbit hole and like touch on every single detail just kind of the details we felt were most necessary to tell the story that we wanted to tell So the first part is going to be on a cult that Steph looked into and was really interested in letting us know about. So Steph, tell us what the cult is. The cult I'm going to be doing today is called the Children of God or what it's known for today as the Family International. Because I'm so fascinated with cults and stuff, I'm also very fascinated with the psychology and the philosophy behind the cults and what their deeper meanings really mean. When I was looking up this cult... I found a interesting statement from a psychologist. Um, his name is Stephen Eichel, and he was a recognized international cult expert, and he was the president of the International Cultic Studies Association. And he says that there are still about 10,000 cults left in the United States. And when I read that, I was like, that is a lot. I don't know that many cults, but I didn't know there was that many out there. That just seems like a lot to me just in the united states alone yeah like i could probably name like 10 off the top of my head like the big ones that everyone knows so the fact that there's ten thousand, like that's crazy and then when you think of like 
how many members are in each cult. That could be like over a million people in this in the U.S. that are a part of a cult, which is crazy to think. That's like a huge number. That shocked me when I found that out. I was like, that's crazy. Before I get into like the details and the case itself, I am going to do a little bit back history on David Berg, who was a founder of Children of God, and just get you a little bit of insight about his his upbringing and what his life was like and just so you can get an understanding of why he was the way he was or why he developed this cult and later on through the episode you'll see how unfortunate this cult is for a lot of members well i mean for every cult is unfortunate for its members just by the nature of it but yeah true but it also depends yeah i'm trying to think too like when you said the ten thousand cults like also depending like what are they considering a cult there's a whole debate i know i listen to a few podcasts about cults but like there's one where it's like is multi-level marketing some people consider that a cult there are some cults that involve sort of that so there's like the thing of like well if you're in an mlm are you also in a cult so i feel like if you're using that umbrella term then like there could be a lot that are considered cults but i think when you think of cults you think of like the most severe cases that we know of like you know the jonestown or like the charles manson Mm -hmm. like that end in like murder and like all that stuff whereas like there might be a little bit of uh, ones that are like kind of culty but not to the extreme that some of them are so the actual definition of a cult from the oxford dictionary is a system of religious veneration and devotion directed toward a particular figure or object or there's a secondary definition of a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister so those are the two main definitions but also that I feel like that's subjective too. There's another definition that I think kind of fits a lot of cults. A misplaced or excessive admiration of a particular person or thing. So with most cults and this one too, there's always that the leader that people just feel is the new messiah or he knows all. And so that's why they follow him because they have these weird feelings towards them for that kind of thing. So that's super typical of a cult. Yeah, and I feel like sometimes, like, cults sort of mix in with religion sometimes. Like, in those kind of definitions do say, like, it's kind of mixed in with, like, this godlike worship of the leader, which well, we're not going to have that discussion of religion is a cult, but that's for another podcast. But. Well, no, a lot of them bring religion into it, and that's why I think they manipulate so many people, because they're saying God's word, and you have to follow him because that's what God wants. So it's, it is very religious, and people get roped into it because of that so yeah and almost like a shaming if you don't abide by the the word of whatever right it's almost like it's a it's a reflection of your bad character if you don't abide by this such and such a rule that's outlined by this godlike figure yeah exactly and it's like you're gonna go to hell or the end of days called so you're not going with everybody else when the world ends if you act out against them so they, you know, they scare people as well into following. Yeah, that's a good point. We'll get into a lot of that worshipping stuff deeper into this case. And you'll see like how people just get roped in and how they just surround their life in this cult. And they think it's a better place to be. And It's almost like FOMO too. Fear of missing out. <laughs> it's kind of hyped up and you don't want to be the one person who like doesn't get to partake in like the, I don't know. There's some psychological thing there going on. We'll get into a lot of that during this case. But before we get into that, I'm going to... I want to talk to you about David Berg's background. Just so you know, you get a sense of how his family dynamic was. Just so you can kind of understand where his his mind was at as he got older. So, David Berg's ancestors were German Jews who converted to Christianity in the 1700s. And they left their communities and went to live in... Ohio and Pennsylvania where they became peace-loving Mennonites and David was brought up in a very religious and rebellious family. He was abused a lot as a young child and when David was just three years old his babysitter started to molest him and his mother Virginia caught the babysitter and fired her on the spot but after that David Berg's mother didn't really think much of it. She didn't really think how damaging it would be to David. So around the 1930s, David traveled with his mother. His mother did a bunch of missionary stuff. So David would travel with his mom all the time and be by her side and he would never really leave her side. 
and he was so fascinated with his mother's leadership and David became more curious as most kids do as he grew up more curious with like just the idea of sex and because his mother was so so religious that when he would like masturbate he would like do it sec- obviously secretly well, he's not going to be like right out of the open <laughs> <laughs> no but like when they were like in hotel rooms or like when they were at like truck stops because his mother traveled a lot he would just go off on his own and you know that's a good thing <laughs> yeah yeah i'd be very i'd be very concerned if it was the other way around but yeah obviously when you're growing up you're like sexually curious and teenage boys see what they do but when his mother would catch him doing things like that she would call him out and she would embarrass him and kind of shame him for exploring his sexuality as a teenager and so it became kind of this like embarrassing degrading kind of aspect of his life where really it should just be part of growing up so i think that's kind of where a lot of his thoughts about sex were kind of twisted because his mother did those kinds of things to him when he was a teenager and also how could they not be i mean when he's molested at that young age that's going to cause sort of a skewed idea of sex and sexuality i feel unless you're addressing it in therapy at an appropriate time but i'm getting the sense that that was not happening Yeah, it seems like very mixed up. Like when he was a young kid, this happened to him. So he's thinking that's what adults do. It's normal, but it's actually not. And then when he tries to explore that himself, you know, his mother's like, this is awful. You know, you're evil for doing things like that. So uh, yeah, it definitely just, he didn't have any way to cope with those kind of feelings. When he was growing up, he um, just saw himself as misunderstood and he became very obsessed with sex itself. David started to distrust authorities and when he graduated from high school his parents spoke with their evangelistic folk group that they were part of they wanted david to be put into this group to like try and i wouldn't say get him some help but try to get him some work and keep his life busy and they try to help him because his parents thought he was a little bit troubled so they try to get david hired full-time in their ministry but this only lasted a few years and he got fired because they thought that he was sleeping with the 17 year old church employee at the time and for david that he seemed to have the control for once like during like this whole time like it was kind of like the secret that he was sleeping with employees so it really made him excited because his whole entire life up until that point he was never never in control of any situation and so when he got fired it just kind of brought him down he started to distance himself from his Christian work and he went back to school to study philosophy and socialism and this is where he became obsessed with sex and all of its facets like he got deeper and deeper into the what does socialism have to do with that I'm not not saying anything bad about I'm just saying it's weird like he studied socialism so he's obsessed with sex like that I feel like it was it's weird maybe it was just his minor (laughs) 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 yeah Yeah, it could have been but university is kind of where he started off his like sexual obsession so you'll get a sense of not not a sense that you'll get the full picture of that throughout this whole entire case so in 1969 david founded the children of god and it started out as kind of a fundamentalist type christian group And like Steph said, he had studied socialism and philosophy, and he was interested in studying communism and things like that, just kind of how the society works, different societies. And he also had aspirations to become a minister. But when he failed at that, he decided that he was just going to start his own Christian group so that he could be the leader. And he particularly targeted youth to be a part of this Christian group. And the children of God went by multiple names throughout the years it started out as the children of god and it's still i think mostly known for being called the children of god a lot of documentaries and things still call it the children of god but it changed its name to the family of love and then it changed to just the family and then finally it changed to the family international in 2004 and that's still its name today And David himself also went by multiple names. He told his followers to call him Moses David, Father David, Dad, or Grandpa. 
And so some of the original members would call him dad, and then their kids would call him grandpa. So like a lot of cults, this one started out with good intentions to help the world, and in this case, to empower youth to get them involved in something positive. According to Christina Babin, who was interviewed on the podcast called Trust Me, it started as a group that was kind of against capitalism. It was rebelling against traditional Christianity, but in kind of a pure way whatever that means and she says that they use music and what she calls love bombing with the promise of consistent happiness to promote the group and you can see this when you watch some of the documentaries about it there's children they're singing and they're playing and they're holding hands and smiling and they're dancing on the beach so that kind of thing and that's what they use to bring people into this group they saw this outside facade of just like this happy singing joyful life But Christina describes a very disturbing reality on the inside. She says that her family got involved when she was just a child and her parents were going through a divorce and it was her mother that decided to take her kids and herself into this group. And just a side note, she says that her father and her grandparents, once her mother tried to get them into this cult, that they actually took them to court. They took her mother and the cult to court for custody because... You know, their father didn't want them raised in this kind of world. But the courts actually sided with the cult. And so the kids, you know, this poor father lost his kids to this group. And those kids didn't really have a chance, didn't have a choice to grow up in in a normal life. So this was all back in the 70s, 60s, early 70s. So once Christina was in the group, she says that her mother kind of gets put into an arranged marriage pretty quickly. And the kids are all taken away, kind of kidnapped almost, and they're shuttled off to various places overseas throughout their entire childhood. They're just traveling around the world with different commune groups. And in 1972, she describes something called the Great Escape. And David said everyone needed to leave America. And so all the different groups that were scattered around America just packed up and they left to go overseas. And once everyone is in this foreign country, they don't know the language, they don't know anybody else except for each other, that's when there was this shift from this happy, idyllic, hippie commune vibe to a sinister focus on control and sex. And soon after they all moved came this this other movement called the One Wife Idea. And it was the idea that everyone was just one big family. Everybody was kind of married to each other. Everyone was your mother and father, and all the kids were siblings, basically. But this kind of led down a, a different path and led to kind of the swinger culture where everyone was sharing wives and the women would just kind of be passed around. And the kids would, too, on these sharing schedules. So the men would kind of have their pick of the group, basically. So David himself was barely seen by any of the members of the cult. And for them to communicate with him, they sent him videos of how things were going so he could essentially keep tabs on everyone. When he communicated with his members, he would often send out letters as his form of communication. And these these letters were called Mo letters, which stood for Moses David. And these letters were given out to his followers and with instructions that they had to follow. Some were prophecies of the end of the world, and he referred to them as end time, writing which depicted the end of the world when Jesus would come back to Earth, which was supposed to happen in 1993. Some of these letters were written in the form of a Dear Abby letter. These letters were weird, and according to a Netflix documentary called The Children of God, They were a mix of comic book style pictures and religious messages. But in a more twisted way, these letters would often have illustrations that were pornographic. And some of the messages told women that they needed to share themselves with other men in the group, whether they wanted to or not. And if they didn't, they would be labeled as selfish and unloving and uncaring. And according to xfamily.org, Berg had written over 3,000 letters in his lifetime. There were many groups that were spread across the world essentially, so David could obviously not be keeping watch over everyone. He was still able to maintain control because he had 
leaders in all of the groups that enforced the rules and would report back to him. It was described as kind of a pyramid scheme of leadership and power, with most members being at the on the bottom and likely feeling as though they could work their way up the more they obey David. So yeah, I'm telling you, there's that connection of the uh, multi-level marketing. Like, that's the thing. I feel like a lot of cults have that sort of pyramid schemey mm-hmm. sort of vibe. Like, I I mean, the, the few that I do know have that similar thing. So I feel like that's a common occurrence. So like many other cults, the Children of God had its own set of rules that the members had to abide by. And for this cult, David controlled every member, every minute of their lives, even the amount of toilet paper that each member would allow to use which was only like three squares and if they used more they were accused of wasting the lord's money you can only have two cups of coffee or tea if you had more you would be walking in disobedience i'd be out i'd be out right there you were never allowed to go out alone they always had to be with a partner and the letters also described how everyone was supposed to dress and everyone was following these instructions exactly the way they were told Once the Children of God became the Family International cult, they developed this term called flirty fishing in 1974, which was the radical plan that David came up with. Flirty fishing was going to be the ultimate way to win the soul of Christ. Yeah, so the whole point of flirty fishing was to try and recruit people because David had them believing that the end of the world was coming and that they needed to recruit as many people as possible to save them when the world was ending and so this was basically just a prostitution ring that was trying to save people from the end of times and so it really was these women going out to any anywhere they could find men and doing whatever they wanted basically and the men would pay them and this was kind of like them trying to win over the men so they would come to this group and save them save their souls something more disturbing is that The women were not allowed to have other jobs, so this was the only way that they could contribute financially, was by this flirty fishing. And they weren't allowed to wear makeup or perfume in their everyday lives, and they were only allowed to do those kinds of things when they were going out to fish. And and so all the little girls in the group would look up to them and aspire to be like them, so that they could grow up, they could wear makeup, get dressed up and be fancy, so they could go out flirty fishing too. So it really does have this sad and twisted reality for those girls, if that's kind of what they're aspiring to be, because that's basically all a lot of them know. And so like I mentioned before, Christina Babin recalls that they were constantly on the run, this group. They were in foreign countries, and they would run from the authorities going from country to country. And she says that she thinks even Interpol at one point had put out a reward for anyone that could give them information that led to the capture of David. So what was happening wasn't going unnoticed, but David was just really good at evading the authorities and convincing people that the government and police and modern society were the enemy. And so that's why he was able to get away with it for so long, and he kind of trained his members to follow along with him. And the kids were taught that sexual activity with the adults was a sacrifice that they just had to make. So to basically be a good person, that's what you just had to do. And even though kids and teenagers, they didn't like it and they just felt weird about it, they grew up thinking that there was just something wrong with them if they didn't want it, because this was kind of their calling. And so if they didn't want to do it, then that was their problem and they had to kind of deal with it anyway and so yeah they they kind of grew up thinking that it was an issue with them because they didn't like it and so that's a very disturbing aspect of it as well so not only do you have the sex abuse going on but then you have this can obviously leads to things like we know what's wrong with me low self-esteem that kind of thing because they're just not understanding what's what's going on and why they're expected to like these kind of things and also they would practice things like mock raids so the adults would pretend to be police and the kids were coached on what to say and how to answer questions and when they actually did get raided like they a lot of the communes got raided around the world and all the kids when they were questioned by the authorities they seemed very happy happy with their life they were very stress-free they had nothing bad to say and so the people that were questioning them 
kind of got the idea that maybe it really wasn't as bad as everyone was saying it is. Like they thought maybe what was going on in there was just kind of rumors in the public. Despite everything that the outside world thought they knew about the cult, these kids and these adults were trained so well that they shed doubts on the authorities. And I think that even after they did get raided, they kind of let them go because they thought that they might have been exaggerating some of the problems. I was just thinking, like, definitely started noticing some themes, like from the cults that I, the few cults that I do know quite well. Um, or are aware of it's like similar themes it seems like very deeply misogynistic stuff like the stuff you were saying about the women who like weren't allowed to have other jobs and like it seems like and that's honestly a common theme i see a lot in the cults it's like very misogynistic towards the women and yeah i don't know it's just crazy it's like some one person could be so manip- manipulative and and it's also too it's like you think like well how can somebody follow these this person but like if you're trained and conditioned to think that everyone on the outside is the enemy then like obviously you're not going to listen to a word that anyone on the outside says and you're only listening to this leader who's telling you that everything's all good and that you guys you know you're doing stuff for the greater good so it's definitely like not too not too like hard to see how that could how somebody could be conditioned to think that yeah and especially when you grow up and that's everything you've known from a kid you just think that's how life is right just imagine the life you have now you imagine if someone came in and said like that's not what reality is and like you're but that's been your life like there's no way we would think that our life isn't the reality you know what i mean so like just think of how hard it would be for someone to believe that yeah and of course you're gonna think like oh this this crazy person is telling me this this person came up to me and said that i'm my life is a lie like obviously i'm not gonna believe this person who i don't know right so obviously you're going to go with what you know and what you're comfortable with. It's kind of like, isn't that like the Truman Show in like that movie? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, you're going to like mistrust everybody that's not a part of your group. So it's just, it's when you think about it that way, it's how easy it is to, you know, just kind of stay there. And I think it's especially like you were saying with kids who grew up like that. I think it's a little bit different. And we'll probably get into it in different cults, but it's like when grown adults can join a cult. It's like when they do know like the real world, but they still become susceptible to falling into these cults, even though they know. Like obviously, you can you can clearly see how like somebody who's grown up in a cult knows thinks that that's reality. So obviously, they're gonna believe it. But like when you think of like how grown adults can also be kind of coerced into these groups when they do know what real life is like, you know, it's just crazy. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's why it's important for a lot of these groups, especially this one, to have that outside view of, oh, we're great, everybody loves each other, it's just like this one big happy family, and they make it sound like something that you would want to be a part of, but then once you get in there, you're stuck. And yeah, so for adults to fall for it, that just shows you how manipulative these leaders are. And it's just, it always fascinates me that he wasn't even like in these groups, like physically telling people what to do. He was writing them letters and they listened to him. So this, that mind control is kind of unbelievable. Yeah. Well, and isn't there that saying, I feel like there's a saying that says like, nobody joins a cult. Everyone joins a good thing. You know, they join something that looks very legitimate. Obviously, if it's presenting itself as a very creepy and a cult, no one's going to join it. Yeah, exactly. And when we get into it a little bit more, they kind of talk about their attempts to cover it up. And... I mean, if but if you're presenting to the world this happy thing that isn't real, like you obviously know something's wrong if you're trying to pretend it's something different to other people, right? So it's kind of hard to be like, well, this is what we're presenting it as, but it's not that. So why, right? You think like that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, and that's why it's, I think cults are so fascinating because like as much as we're going to do this four part miniseries and we're going to be so like exhausted and looked into so many different cults, but it's like as much as we're going to do that, we can never understand what it's like because we are not in a cult right so i think it's also too it's also important to say that like you know this is our outside perspective having never been in a cult when you know we can't know what kind of goes into the mindset aj you bring up a good point because my next what i'm going to talk about goes into like two former cult members and their perspective on how they got out and so you kind of can pictured in your mind of how it was like and i feel like the three of us i would consider us empathetic people like we can you know be empathetic with people and put ourselves in other people's positions but like it's still not the same there's only so much that we can know and there's only so much that we can understand having never been in a cult so while we can be sympathetic or empathetic we still we've never been in it obviously we're not 
judging or blaming them for being in a cult, right? Because you think, oh, that would never happen to me. But everybody says that. And it does happen to a lot of people. So when you think about how many people are brainwashed, like if there's 10,000 10, cults, how many people have been brainwashed who are in those cults? You know what I mean? Like, obviously, it's a real thing that can happen. So yeah, like we can acknowledge that it does happen, even though we can't really understand how you could fall for it or not even fall for it. Because I feel like fall for it sounds negative. Mm -hmm. Be susceptible to that. Yeah, exactly. Greetings, we're Technically a Conversation, a podcast for curious people by curious people. Every week, we take turns presenting a new topic, and the other host has no idea what the topic will be. We strive to educate in a way that's loose and fun. Our topics are all over the place, from light and funny to dark and sometimes spooky. Some of the topics we've covered include urban legends, civil rights activists, vampires, pop culture icons, the supernatural and occult, spies and espionage, science and astronomy, and other weird and random things. If any of these topics interest you, give our podcast a shot. Listen and subscribe at technicallyaconversation.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Parental advisory, we might use strong language. I'm going to talk a little bit about two documentaries that I watched. So when I was researching this cult, I watched a lot of different documentaries. But there were two that I watched that I really liked. So I'm kind of going to go into, into depth about those two and kind of get a like first person perspective on what it was like in the cults. The first one I watched was a documentary on Netflix called Children of God. And the second one I watched was a documentary called Children of God, Lost and Found. And that one you can watch on Crave HBO. And both of these films were made in first person of former members that had gotten out of the cult and now they are talking about it. So the first one I'm going to be talking about is the Netflix documentary. This one was about a mother named Sylvia and her two daughters who were telling the stories and about their experience in the cult. So I'm just going to talk about one incident that happened in the documentary as Sylvia was telling it. Sylvia was a mother of seven children. She describes like in the documentary that she never wanted that many children. And because she was living in this cult, she had no choice. Obviously, she was kind of forced to have as many children as she could birth control was not allowed in the cult so even if they wanted to go that route they wouldn't be allowed to yes that's a good point so yeah so sylvia describes one incident that one of her daughters had contracted lupus at the age of 15 which is an autoimmune disease so if she would go in this hot sun it would flare up her symptoms of lupus so a sylvia's daughter would always stay in and read books and because she couldn't go outside, so it's all she ever did was read. But according to David, books were a waste of time and not encouraged as well as their education. Like, they weren't encouraged to be educated, is what Sylvia was saying in, the, in this documentary. And also in the cult, it was frowned upon to take medicine. So for Sylvia's daughter, this was very devastating, according to Sylvia, because she required to take medicine for her illness but her mother would often let her daughter take the medicine but when she did she felt extremely guilty to the point where the daughter just eventually stopped taking it because she just couldn't face the fact that she was disobeying David and disobeying the rules of the of the cult so she just stopped taking it yeah and I think another thing to point out because I watched the documentary as well so her taking that medicine made her daughter kind of feel weak and that God didn't love her as much because she had to take this medicine and she was sick and she was made to feel that God was punishing her. So it was kind of that thing. She was sick, but she was also kind of being bullied in a way because she was sick. Yeah, which is really sad to think of. Like, she wants to feel better, but yet she feels guilty for feeling better. But... She also feels guilty. So she's supposed to just feel sick for the rest of her life then? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, well, I think the idea was that she's God's punishing her. That's why he made her sick. So if she's just a better person, 
he'll heal her. So it was kind of that mentality. But if you're taking medicine, you're going against God, so it's really not helping in the long run. So she does eventually come off her lupus medication. And because she came off of, of the medication in 1982, she was unconscious for three days, and then she ended up dying right in front of her sisters. And Sylvia describes this as devastating to herself and to her other children. Sylvia explains in the documentary that no one, like, no one even came to pray for her. No one even came to, like, give her condolences. No one came to, like, make sure she was okay. Because to them, it was an embarrassment to the group because she was ill. So just to, like, not even accept the fact that she was even ill. Like, they didn't even, like, say their story. Like, it was just really devastating, Sylvia said, for, for her, but mostly for her children to watch her daughter, their sister, die. Because nobody cared and not even after she died, nobody cared to say, you know, hope you're okay. Like most people would do, like if you're a sympathetic person, you would have any empathy, you would show your condolences to the family. Her death was seen as an embarrassment and like a weakness for her family and more as if, you know, more than just an actual sickness. And so she died and it was kind of embarrassing. So that's kind of the mentality that people just had in the group. Like it's like a moral failing on your part. If you get sick. It is. They must have thought, like, what did this family do for God to hate them so much that one of their kids died? So it's, you know, their faults for not being as good as they could be. In this documentary as well, um, the women and children were forced to do videos at a very young age. They were forced to strip in front of the camera, and they would often strip while young children were in the room. The children were subjected to sex at a very young age. Some of the children were... Uh, sexually abused at the age of seven and a lot of the women would sleep together with their partners naked in one like it showed in the picture like it showed pictures of like the mattresses like laid out in this big room and they would all have to sleep together with their partners but naked in this like big bed of mattresses all together like they like that's how they would sleep yeah, and it's super weird in these videos, like, the women would be naked and they'd... It was like a video to David, and then I'd be like, Oh, we love you, David. We wish you were here. Next time we see you, I want to give you a kiss. Things like that, like, super gross and just... Ugh. And, like, all these women were, like, super happy in the bed. And it was just... it's It was weird. Also, just, like, the marking, like, all of these leaders, it's, like, extreme narcissism. The worst kind of narcissism when it's, like... Well, I mean, not that there's good kind of narcissism but like just like when they take it to the extreme and like they never get called out for it or nothing no intervention happens it's like that's what can happen i know Ugh. so the second documentary that i watched was the children of god lost and found the documentary is told from a first person perspective of what it was like growing up in the cult karen zerby who is david berg's wife had a son named noah and noah is the one who made this documentary the children of god lost and found and when noah was making this documentary he made it because he wanted well because he wanted to tell his story about getting out of the cult with his brothers so during this documentary noah travels and he's trying to meet up with cult ex-members and he has like a list of these people and they're all like very interested in talking to him and they want to talk about their experience but Once he starts calling them for interviews, they all start not wanting to do it anymore. Like they just all of a sudden just don't want to talk about it, don't want anything to do with it. He had to stop for a period of time because he got really depressed and just all the thoughts coming back from him being in the cult were just getting to him. So he had to put the documentary on hold and just work on his mental health. But when he started working on it again he wanted to interview his mother Karen so he decides to ask his mom a few questions if she wants to talk about the cult and she basically says like I don't want to talk about the cult like you left she's still in the cult to this day and because he got out of it and was interviewing her or interviewing people about the cult and kind of putting like a negative spin on what the cult was she just yeah, I, w- well, I wouldn't say it's a negative spin. It's just negative. No, I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just tell them the truth uh, about the cult. 
<laughs> yeah, it's not spin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's so sad, though. Yeah. Like the fact that she's still in it. I'm surprised she's even allowed to talk to him at all, or that she even talked to him at all. Like you'd think that she would just not answer his phone calls instead of saying like, you know, did she actually? Did he actually make contact with her? And she said, "I can't talk to you." Versus, or she just in the video, he is talking to her. Like in the documentary, she is, he is talking to her, but very, very brief moment, and like. She just says, like, I don't I don't want anything to do with this documentary. Like, I don't want to talk to you. And then she, he doesn't, like, hear from his mom for, like, several days. This puts him, to, him into, like, a deep depression because she he thinks that something happened to her because she was really angry. She didn't want him to do this documentary, but she also didn't want him to be calling her about it. And so when she hung up the phone, uh, Noah was just very, like, you can see in the documentary if you watch it, like, he's just scared that something happened to her. And he wanted to, like, meet up with her and talk to her about it. And, like, she didn't want anything to do with that. Obviously, like, she didn't want to be, like, seen with him because if he was out of the cult and, and whatnot. So she calls and says, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. I don't want anything to do with this documentary. I don't want anything. I don't want people getting the wrong idea about <laughs> this cult. Like, she was making him feel like what he was trying to do was bad and that he was saying all these bad things about the cult but she probably never used the word cult <laughs> i don't want you to say bad things about this cult and also just to clarify like karen is now the new leader so she can probably bend the rules to talk to her son who's out of it so just that's probably important to state karen also had another son his name was ricky rodriguez he got out of the cult but he had a more disturbing like after he got out of the cult, he was more disturbed from being in the cult and on the memories he um had a mental breakdown and kind of went downhill after being in the cult. So Ricky left the cult in 1999. And after he left the cult, he became very angry and sought revenge on those who hurt him, especially his mother. Like he wanted revenge on his mother for bringing him up in this cult. But he couldn't track down his mother at the time. So instead he tracked down one of his nannies that he had while he was in the cult and there's a youtube clip that they show in the documentary about of him talking about killing people and talking like sharpening his knives as he's talking to the camera and it's really creepy like you kind of feel bad for him he's so angry at what went on in the cult and how he was treated that like getting out of the cult he just couldn't come to grips with what had happened to him i also feel like that's not a healthy obviously attitude either like you know you get out of the call i feel like at some point when you get out of the call and again this is just easy easier said than done from someone who's never been in one but like i feel like where you blur this line between like when are you guilty of committing these crimes versus when are you also the victim too because like everyone who's in the call is just in it because they think that they're doing god's work or they think that they're doing you know saving the world or that they're doing these great things so it's like they're doing it they think that they're doing a good thing, but they're doing all this horrible stuff versus like somebody who knows it's bad and is doing it anyway, which I feel like is like the intent when you're actually the bad person versus like when you're doing it because you think it's right. You know what I mean? Like you're doing it with noble intentions, even though it's heinous. No, I'm not saying that it's good to do. Obviously, like I'm not making excuses for them, but I feel like that's also too it's a blurred line because it's like. So I feel like at some point, if you get out of the cult, it's like, well, you have to realize that these people were also victims and are under the spell and are also doing things that he himself may have done to other people. You know what I mean? So I feel like you can't really be out and like, you're so angry at all these people because it's like you were also in their shoes at one time. But also, I don't want to make it sound like I'm making excuses for them. But I can also see why he'd be angry at kind of the life that they made him believe and it was because of them that he did all those things. And if you know it wasn't for them, he would never have been in that situation. When I was listening to the podcast called Trust Me, you know they they made, brought up a good point saying it takes people usually a long time to come to terms with their feelings when they leave the cult. Just the fact that yes, they did some of these things. So kind of to admit that to themselves and to everybody else is kind of something that can take years and decades. And admitting that what they believed for like 30 years is a lie, so, like overcoming that. And once you finally realize what these people did to you for decades would make you angry, I feel. So I feel like it's just how you deal with those once you realize what happened. Yeah. And I'm not like, and I understand that obviously like 
he's human everyone's human like you're obviously going to be angry i'm not saying that like i would deal with it any better like i would probably be worse like who knows but like again like just objectively from someone who again never been in a call i'm just saying like it's just interesting to think about sort of where that line is and like we'll get into it when we talk more about in the fourth part when we talk about that cult that we're going to talk about in the fourth part it's like certain people who were like charged and stuff it's like well at what point were they like yes they're guilty of all these things but they're not i don't know you're not you're not consenting to something when you're brainwashed you know what i mean like how can you say that somebody's guilty of like consenting to do these horrible things when like they're not even aware that they're doing horrible things you know what i mean I know. But then also when you think like adults that have lived lives outside of the cult and they come in and then start abusing kids. like Yeah, yeah. Take, I think like it would take a long time for them to feel like that was okay. You know what I mean? Like, like having to be in there for like 50 years to be like, okay, actually maybe this is okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. So I feel like people doing that, it's hard for me to be like, oh, they were brainwashed right away. And then they started abusing kids. So, mm. Because they lived a life outside that wasn't brainwashed, so they know. Yeah. But we were also talking before about, like, brainwashing is a thing, and it's so so dangerous because it can happen to everyone. So it's, like, obviously it was really powerful brain. I don't know. Like, it's so I feel like it's so hard because, and I'm not trying to, like, I'm just, I'm not just trying to say that, like, all these people who are in cults and doing horrible things, like, aren't guilty of doing horrible things, because obviously they are. Like, especially these people who are, like, yeah. doing all these horrible things they have to be like held accountable for their actions of course but i just think that there is that kind of l- blurred line well there is that blurred line and it's there's a difference between i think brainwashing to make people believe something and believe in a person that's completely bullshit but then there's also brainwashing them to do things that should be morally wrong but it's just so interesting when people they have this life outside of the cult and then You know, and they wouldn't dream of doing some of these things and they get in there and somehow they kind of lose all their morality. Like, you know what I mean? So it's interesting that they can just kind of switch off what they used to think was right and follow the leader. I always get so torn and like, obviously, I keep mentioning like the last cult we're going to talk about, like watching those documentaries and stuff. And it's like so torn because obviously like these people are doing horrible things and you have to say, well, no, they should be held accountable. They're doing horrible things, but brainwashing is not consent to something and like if you think that you're doing it i don't know i don't want to sound like i'm making excuses for these people because obviously they're fucked but there is a level of sort obviously they've been manipulated as well so they wouldn't have otherwise done these things if they hadn't been manipulated by this person necessarily so yeah and it's kind of like coercion isn't it it's like you're basically making them believe something that's not real for them to do what you want them to do like i just feel like it would be a very hard thing to prove like in court of like how do you prove that somebody's guilty of something when you can just say well they were brainwashed so they're not actually Mm -hmm. you know consenting to doing these things when they're like under the influence of someone yeah right like isn't it the term like undue influence or like a victim of undue influence Mm -hmm. which is like literally what that is so yeah it's interesting like i was saying for Ricky Rodriguez, like, getting out of the cult, it was such a... It, it didn't bode well for him. Like, he had he had struggled a lot with his mental health and just struggled with being in the real world. And unfortunately, like, he became, like I said, very angry. And he wanted revenge on his mother. But because he couldn't track down his mother, he ended up tracking down one of his nannies that he had while he was in the cult. And... Because he was so angry and so full of revenge that he took her out for dinner, this nanny out for dinner, and kind of befriending her, like, maybe she thought he wanted to talk about the call, and because he was her nanny, he knew her him, and maybe he wanted just to... She didn't really know what he wanted, so he just kind of she kind of went along with him. So they went out to dinner, and then he invited her back to his place. And unbeknownst to her, he took her back to his place, and then he ended up torching and killing her by slashing her throat so it goes to show like just how disturbed he was after leaving the cult after ricky he then fled from the scene but he ended up killing himself shortly after that with the bullet to the head so kind of it just goes to show like because you get out of the cult doesn't mean your life 
is now free. Like you still have those demons of what was like being in the cult. And it's just unfortunate that he took his anger out on somebody else. Well, I feel like I, you see in other cases too, where it's like, they say that it's in some cases, like leaving it is so bad because of all the after effects. Or like, if you're harassed by the organization after it's like, it's almost easier if you were just stayed in the cult, but it's like leaving is Mm -hmm. a whole new set of struggles comes from leaving. And you know, the easier road would be to just like do the status quo, like leave the status quo. But when you leave and disrupt like all of that, then it's worse. And then like obviously you have the after effects and all the trauma and everything. So Yeah, especially when that's all you know and you don't know anything about the outside world. So how are you supposed to survive out there? It goes back to, I think, what we were talking about before. And for this cult in particular, I think it's important to kind of note some of the things that went on to make everyone so immersed in kind of that lifestyle that they were in, especially for the kids that were born and grew up in the cult. You know, they were living this indoctrinated way of life. They believed that the outside world was evil and that they could not survive if they left. They had actual things called reprogramming camps where they would completely just brainwash kids. They could only read writings from David and kind of just spent this time getting to reprogram their brain, basically. And they were separated from their parents, probably separated from a lot of people that they already knew. And so if anyone even uttered a thought that they were thinking about leaving or thinking about the outside world, they would be severely punished. They called them exorcisms and there would be public ridicule in front of the whole group. They would be put in solitary confinement for months at a time. So people were even afraid to think about leaving. And some who actually did get away were eventually brought back to the communes by even police sometimes, because a lot of times they were in foreign countries. They didn't know the language. They didn't know where they were. Their passports had been taken away. They didn't have any sort of ID. So the their only plan was, you know, eventually to go back there. And that's basically all they could do. And like Steph had said earlier, they were growing up, a lot of the kids were denied regular education. They weren't allowed to have books. And they weren't even allowed to show that they had any kind of stronger feelings towards one person over another. So you couldn't have you couldn't call somebody your best friend. You couldn't have romantic feelings or have a love interest for any one person in particular because that just wasn't allowed. You kind of had to love everybody the same. And kids were very often separated from their parents. They would take the kids and take them across the world, different countries. The parents wouldn't know where they were. Kids wouldn't know where their parents were. And some would even go years without even any contact from their parents. So they're completely isolated from their own parents and probably from their siblings and from some of their friends. So they're completely alone and all they have is really other people in the group that they're with. And yeah, so when people did escape, some teenagers did eventually get out. They ended up homeless on the streets and a lot of them died. There were a lot of suicides going on. And so I think that's just kind of like the overview of why it was so hard and impossible for some people to leave. So yeah, so the Family International, which is what it's called today, is still actually a cult to this day. But there is a lot of criticism about the cult. A lot of it comes from ex-members of the cult and anti-cult movements, and also the press. The ex-members have accused the family's leadership of following a policy of lying to the outsiders and being steeped in the history of sexual deviance. They also accuse them of meddling in the into third world politics but of course the family also replies and denies all of this and they deny all these criticisms deny all these things are going on and they say that they are a victim of persecution um which i mean you can't really i don't know you can't really like the truth's out there so people know about this cult so for them denying it all is just but i mean of course they're going to deny it they're not going to you're so conditioned to like not believe anything that anyone out from the outside world tells you so it's like it doesn't even matter what is out there about this cult because they're not even gonna believe a single word of it anyway so it's like the people who need to hear it the most are the ones that won't be listening but yeah like even after david berg died 
Like he died in 1994. That's when his wife Karen took over, and she changed some of the rules. Maybe trying to like appease the outside world to make it not look as bad. She changed some of the rules. Like you're not allowed to have sex with anyone that's under 16. It's like oh, congrats for like following the law. I don't know. So just like ease up on some of the rules. Like you were allowed to have more than one cup of coffee every day if you wanted. So it was like those kind of things that she thought was you know, going to attract more people and may- or maybe not have the press ease off of, you know, them thinking how bad they were when basically it was just like basic morality that they were finally coming in tow to. You're you're allowed to drink an extra cup of coffee a day. Look, we're not so bad. <laughs> like what? <laughs> yeah, I know. So when I was watching the documentary on Netflix, at the very end, they had interviewed one of the families of the cult today, like one of the newer families of today or one of the families that's been there for a while. And the interviewer asks uh, this guy about, like, the pornographic videos and, like, all the other videos that David Berg had sent. And just all the stuff about the cult and, the like, the inappropriate stuff about the young children. And the guy that he's interviewing just basically, like, says that, oh, there was nothing. Like, I don't know where they got their information from. Like, there's nothing about that. I don't know anything about that. Like, that's not what we're, what we represent. We don't do that type of stuff in this cult i almost think like i hate when like honestly i hate half the time when reporters go and interview people like what do you expect them to say like it's just annoying it's like you, don't, don't even bother interviewing them like they're not going to believe anything you say they're going to be combative defensive like you're not going to get anything out of that interview and i feel like more of so it's just like oh mocking them like oh look how like brainwashed they are and look how crazy they look like i hate that shit yeah you can't just put someone on in an interview and expect them to like completely open up about that kind of stuff but also the cult did like a purge back in the day where they burnt all the kids' passports so that someone coming in for an investigation couldn't see all the stamps on the passports and they couldn't see how much they like traveled around the world with these kids because that probably would look really sketchy. And they got rid of a lot of the pornography videos and a lot of like the letters that were very pornographic. And they said they would make the kids like draw bathing suits on all like the naked pictures so it wouldn't be naked pictures but they were covered up so it was like really like really weird stuff like that to try and cover their tracks yeah well that shit okay that is like next level like before when i said like oh are you willing you know that you're doing bad stuff well it's like obviously if you're going to those lengths to cover up the stuff that you're doing then you know that it's bad that you're doing and you should but i guess in their minds it's like oh no it is good they just don't think it they don't see it as good so they're gonna persecute us so that's how they like twist it yeah, that's what a lot of them did think. Because David was telling them that if you don't do this, they're going to try and hurt us. But like, so, so, so we were saying, look, the interview, the the person interviewing them was like interviewing someone who was still in the cult. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why it's like, I don't even know what the point of interviewing them would be. Like, you're, yeah, cause you're not expecting them to say, oh, yeah, you're right. And the guy that he was interviewing just basically said, like, all this negative stuff is putting like a bad name towards the cult because that's not what we, that's not what we represent. Like, we don't condone that stuff and like of course he's gonna say that like what do they expect him to say like that's what i hate but maybe it is very different today i'm not approving of it but you know maybe all that stuff really isn't common practice like everything i've heard is from the 70s and 80s and how bad it was at its worst so you know maybe it has cleaned itself up but maybe we'll never know yeah i mean it could be they could have cleaned itself up but they still haven't been held accountable for the stuff that they did before if they did clean it up so I feel like. Yeah, well, David's dead now, so he is the one that needs to be held accountable, and he can't. And his wife, probably, yeah. too. She's still the leader, I think. It's crazy to me how how is that still even al- allowed to exist? Like, it's out there. Everyone knows it exists. Everyone knows what they're doing. Everyone knows that all these illegal things are happening, and none of them are in jail. A lot of it has to do with the statute of limitations, where a lot of these people that were abused, it's too late. They come forward, and it's already past whatever the statute of limitations. So even if it is true, oh my God. the law can't do anything. So that's a lot of what happened, I think, because it takes, you know, decades for people to even come forward with this kind of thing. Which I don't understand, the law, like, the statute of limitations law. I don't even know why that's a thing. I know. How has that not been stricken down or taken away? I know. It doesn't make... It, it makes no sense. But anyway, I think that's a, the big problem here. And it's just annoying, too, because it's, like, I guess, from a legal perspective, it's like, you can't do anything until someone comes forward. But then when they do come forward, it's already too late. So it's like... But it's like this thing where it's like, everyone knows it's happening, which is so annoying. But, like, they can't legally 
do anything, which is so annoying. Yeah, and they don't actually have proof except years later, once it's too late. And that's just one person against the other. And also, they've trained all the kids to say things if anything does happen, so the kids aren't going to say anything. Anyway, so it's just like a huge mess. Even other cults like Scientology and things like that, like that's still a thing today when we know that that's, you know, fucked up. So, yeah. I know. Fuck, we should do a whole mini series on Scientology. <laughs> no, I'd be scared. <laughs> I just want to mention that there are some notable people that were involved in this cult. Some of them you may know, some of them you probably don't know. Um, so I'm just going to name name them off. And yeah. Christopher Owens, who was a, mu- a musician in San Francisco indie band called Girls. And he was brought up in the, in the Children of God cult by his parents. Also, there was um, Juliana Barring. I think I'm saying that right. She was the first woman to bike around the world. And she's also a co-author of Not Without My Sister. She was brought up in the cult with her sister. And I think her her book is about her leaving the cult. You guys probably all know who this is. Rose McGowan. Uh, She was in Charmed. And she's also like a film actress. She brought down Harvey Weinstein. Yes. There's a lot of interviews with her about her talking about the cult. We all know River Phoenix and Joaquin Phoenix. Their family, along with his sister Rain and his other sister Summer, they were all members of the cult from 1972 to 1978. And River Phoenix said in an interview with Detailed Magazine in 1991 that the cult ruins people's lives. And unfortunately, uh, River died of a drug overdose in 1993. So you can kind of see how he struggled after he left the cult. And then there's um, Tina Dupe. She was an American journalist and a syndicated columnist, and she was also in the cult. And then this one kind of shocked me. Jeremy Spencer, who is a blues slide guitarist and founding member of Fleetwood Mac, he joined the cult in 1971 as an adult. So he quit the band and went, which is crazy to me it's crazy because obviously he was an adult and knew what the real world was and so that's crazy to think like what persuaded him and he had a pretty good life because he was part of this well-renowned band and decides to leave yeah that's crazy and like also i just did a quick search of him and yeah like apparently he created a new band once he was in the cult and like toured around the country this is just like a quick like google search so i haven't gone in depth but sounds really creepy and yeah it's crazy to think that somebody like of that age at, as an adult would just be i'd be interested to like know like what persuaded him or who convinced him it's just weird i mean maybe it was what's his name david berg himself who convinced him but like how does that happen <laughs> it's just like weird yeah that's weird it's crazy it's a crazy cult it's crazy that it still exists in existence today, like, with all the stuff that's out there about it, and it's like, it's still alive, and I don't know how, I was going to say it's still alive and well, but... In 2010, the Family International disassembled its previous organizational framework and currently exists only as a small online network. A small online community? I mean, they're still... It's like a small-scale version of what they were before, so it's like, they're still in existence, but not to the level that they were. Although, who really knows what's going on? I mean, if that's what they're saying, they're a small online community, like... Who knows what they're trying to keep hidden or... But at least to this day and age, and online things are way easier to track and prove if things happened than just out on some hippie commune somewhere. I mean, they could be doing all this online stuff that's like very peaceful and very innocent, but then on these communes, that's when the real shit's going down that can't be tracked. Yeah, but they're not on communes anymore. It's just all online. How do you know that, though? We don't know that. Well, that's what that's what the Family International says, the website. That's true. I don't fucking <laughs> you believe what they say. I don't. I mean, like, they've also been saying that they're been innocent, innocent this whole time, so. It's kind of crazy to think all those people that I mentioned, they were in the cult, but got out, and now they're actors or journalists. So, like, when you do get out, there is a lot of hope for people who do get out and try to make a life for themselves but a lot of people do turn to like suicide and drugs and stuff because they can't just they can't I guess they can't come to grips with what had happened to them as growing up they can't just get those 
thoughts out of their mind or whatever. Yeah, it's probably hard to like forget or overcome some of the things that they had to do or witness. It's crazy. It's a crazy cult. That was part one of our cult mini series. So join us next week. We're going to be doing part two. We're going to dive deep into another cult. And yeah. And as we go along, I'm sure you're going to start to see these patterns. Um, You're going to see a lot of common themes that a lot of these cults do have. It's a lot of similar things that happen. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to kind of see those connections between all these different cults. Um, that all happen at like different time periods and in different countries and everything like that. So definitely interesting. So yeah, thanks so much for for tuning into part one. Uh, you can, as always, follow us on all the social medias: Crime Family Podcast on Instagram, Crime Family Pod One on Twitter, Crime Family Podcast on Facebook, and our email is the same as always: Crime Family Podcast at gmail dot com. That's where you can send us all of your suggestions and feedback and tips and all of that stuff. Also. Go to our website at crimefamilypodcast.ca. That's kind of our hub for everything for the podcast. So you can listen to all of our episodes there and look at transcripts and all of that stuff and leave us a voicemail. So if you want to hear yourself on the podcast, maybe you want to leave us a voicemail about a theory that you have from one of our previous cases or a case suggestion or whatever you would like. Uh, We would love to hear from you. So definitely do that. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, We'll see you next week for part two. Take care. Bye. Bye.